it's on tonight and tomorrow morning. So hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, um, we won't get any and it won't cut out. Okay, so it's seven o'clock. So hello and welcome to this week's seminar. Um, an apology for the state of me. It is boiling hot and it's humid. Obviously, if you're watching this live, you know that. Uh, if you are watching this on YouTube in six months time, you might be like, why does she look so frazzled? It's just an se online seminar. It's really, really hot today. Okay, so today's seminar is gonna be looking at live showing. So it's titled Secrets of a Show Host. So it's all about hosting your own live show. As always, if you wanna get involved throughout the seminar, you can post a question. Um, if you're using a mobile phone, it's down the bottom. If you're using um, a web browser, you'll see that the comment section is along the side and you can type your little question in. I've got my Chromebook here, my lovely Chromebook, and I can see all of your comments um, so I can respond to your questions. As always, there's a delay between me talking and what you see, so there'll be a bit of a delay between me seeing your question. Um, the discussion post should post at one minute past seven, so you can post any questions in there. There is also a link in there to our website where we have a written guide to running your live show, and we also have tons of free downloadable resources. This includes a full schedule, it includes spreadsheets for you to use, it includes like loads of different schedules, schedules for specialist shows, non-specialist shows, lots of different things. They are free to use, all we ask is you keep your co our copyright on them and you don't distribute them without our permission. Um, but apart from that, you can use them and you can run your own show and that takes a bit of the stress away from you. So what are we gonna talk about today? Today we're gonna be talking about eight different things, which is really long for one seminar, but I'm not really sure how I could narrow this down, so I'm gonna try and talk really, really fast. So we're gonna be talking about, first of all, picking a venue. Secondly, writing your schedule. Thirdly, um, opening for entries and how to cope with that. Fourthly, uh, what you need to do before you're running your show. So um, BMX applications, all the things you need to buy, and I've got some examples here. Uh, fifthly, we're gonna look at the week before, so all the things you need to be doing um, in the direct run up to your show. Then we're gonna talk about the show day, what you need to be doing as a show host on the day, how you can make it run really smoothly, how you can keep everyone happy. Then we're gonna talk about post-show, so what do you need to do after you've run a live show? And finally, because I know this is something that some people have asked me to address, we're gonna talk about drama llamas. Not the drama llama, who is on a shelf over here somewhere, I think. I don't know where she is. Ooh, I think she's at the top. Poor drama llama. Um, but how do we deal with sort of Facebook problems afterwards? How do we deal with things going on during the show? How do we deal with those more difficult characters within the hobby? All those kind of things, like how do you approach those? And that is probably actually the hardest part of running a live show. It's certainly not something I've perfected, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I make sure that I can deal with that. And I basically take the same approach as I do with my teaching, which is that I have black and white rules, you break them, you're punished. Simple as that. So, um, let us get started. Marion says it's working properly. <laughs> Wee! That's good to know, Marion. I'm glad that it is working properly and you can watch it nice and streamlined today and not glitchy. That makes me happy. Karen, I um, have got your message. I just haven't responded to it because I've been really, really busy. I will respond to it. Okay, so I have got your payment. We're going to start by talking about picking a venue. And this is probably the hardest bit of actually setting up your show. It may seem really, really easy to find a venue. You must think there's loads of village halls. It's really easy. I can tell you now it's not. It's actually really stressful and it's actually really hard. And finding a venue, if you can find a venue that works for you and works within your budget and the people are nice, you stick with it. Like even if you're like me and you move two and a half hours away, you stay with that venue because you love that venue. So what do you need to think about when you're picking your venue? If you go to lots of shows, then you've probably already got an idea about what a live show venue should be like. Usually it's gonna be in a village hall or a community center or something similar to that. So the first thing you wanna think about is the location. One of the things I like about my show hall is that it's right next to the M40, literally, motorway here, show hall here, really, really good. Um, and it also has public transport links from London and you do have to walk through a field, but you know, people can pick you up, it's fine. A bit of field walking never hurt no one. So that's really, really nice. A, 
The location that's more in the country is fine, it's actually fine, but people might have to travel further. If you can get a location that's near a motorway junction, it's really, really useful because actually you've got all those transport links. So someone who's traveling from Macclesfield, for example, will travel the same distance to get to my show in the south of England in Oxfordshire as they would do to get to Herefordshire Live. Um, and I know that because I've driven to Macclesfield from both locations. So it's, it can really make a massive impact. And it's something you do want to think about. If you can get someone with public transport links, that's great because there are members of the hobby that still don't drive. You then need to think about the amenities in the hall. So what is the hall providing you? The most important thing are tables. Now tables are going to be actually where you're going to just completely fall down because that is something that halls don't necessarily have a huge amount of. So a general live show will have 15 entrants. Each of those entrants needs a full size table. You're also going to have three rings and you need a full size table for those. So as a bare minimum, you need 18 full size tables. On top of that, you're going to need additional tables, maybe to extend rings. You're going to need somewhere to put the raffle. If a hall has a stage, you can often just lay it out on the stage, like on the actual lip of the stage. That works absolutely fine. Some halls have things like kiddie tables, they have smaller tables, and you can adapt those to suit different things. If you've got half size tables or little tables, you could sell half tickets, that's something we do, um, and that's quite a good use for those tables. But generally speaking, 18 full size tables. If you are going to have 15 entrants, you then need 30 chairs. Chairs are usually not a problem, but I have been to a few halls where they are in a little bit sort of sparse and you've got to fight for them. So generally speaking, I would say you should have two chairs per entrant. So one large table per entrant and two chairs per entrant. You then need to think about the kitchen facilities. Now, if you've got a hall that's free or really, really cheap and it's only got toilets and it doesn't actually have a kitchen, but they're fine with you maybe having a table with a kettle on um, and people can wash up in the toilets, if it's free, I would go for it because actually at the end of the day, that doesn't matter too much. Yes, it's a bit inconvenient, but the amount of money you'll save, and you can pass that on to entrance, you can say, actually, I don't have to charge the full entry price for the show because I'm saving all this money. But generally speaking, you want a kitchen with running water and a tap and a kettle. Kettle is the single most important thing. And a fridge, particularly in the summer. Imagine a day like today sat in a show hall. It's horrific. If you can get one with a freezer, that's even better because then you can have chalk ices. So you want to make sure there is a kettle. If it has a kitchen and no kettle, you can obviously bring a kettle from home as long as the show hall is fine with that. Check to have a look at things like cups and teaspoons. For some reason, all the teaspoons keep going missing from my show hall, so I have to bring my own. Um, make sure that if it doesn't have things like cups provided, you tell entrance in advance, and of course, accommodate for the fact that people might forget by bringing some of your own. So things like that you can accommodate for. And the final thing you're gonna take into account when you're looking at the amenities is the parking. Assume that everyone is going to be bringing their own car because lift sharing is quite rare for live shows. So you're going to need parking spaces for 15 cars minimum. Um, you might be bringing two cars. So you might have a car that has got extra stuff in if you've got to bring lots for the show and your cars are quite small. So also think about the fact that you might have to be bringing two cars. So have a look at the parking. If you're running a show in winter, if the overflow parking is in a field, take that into account as well. Also take into account access. Um, everywhere has to have disabled access now, it's a legal requirement, but you don't want people traipsing upstairs and things like that with boxes. You don't want them traipsing miles from the car park. I've been to shows where you've had to cross roads and it's not very fun crossing roads with boxes full of artist resins and then you've got to get from the car park and into the show and from the show and into the car park. All of that just delays stuff and it makes people stressed and it makes you stressed. So just think about that and think about what you would want as a show attendee. And Holly's made it quite clear that she needs a cup of tea. Very important. We're going to talk about tea again later. Once you've looked at all of that, you need to think about the price. Now, I have one very strict rule when it comes to hiring halls. I will not hire anywhere that only wants to charge per the hour. There's a really good reason for this, and that is that I don't want to be tied in to having to be out for a certain time and I don't want the show hall people to have hired the hall out in the evening. If they've hired it out in the evening to a party that starts at seven o'clock and your show doesn't finish till six, you're going to overlap with those people. Because I think quite a lot of the time, show hire, um, hall hire people don't really think about setup and organisation and they also don't communicate to the two parties that 
there's someone else using the hall. Um, and that can get really, really problematic and it can involve um, confrontation and it can involve stuff being damaged. So avoid that at all costs. I usually just say to them, look, I want your blanket rate for all day hire. Um, this is an estimate of where I will be in. I normally estimate I'll be in between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. But I don't want to be out by a certain time and I don't want you to hire it out to anyone else in the evening. And if that's a problem, I'll find a different venue. Simple as that. For me, that is like the big deal clincher. And Claire, I was just thinking of that show when I said it. And the people with the balloons, and oh, it was, it was horrible, wasn't it? It was actually horrible. So yeah, we've had experience of that and it was not fun. Um, so in terms of price, my haul is really cheap. I pay 70 pounds for all day hire. Um, the most I've ever paid for an all day hire is 150, uh, but I got a discount because I was doing it over two days. So it was 300 pounds for the whole weekend. Um, and I had to hire extra tables on top of that. So if there are no tables and you're having to hire extra tables, you're gonna have to factor that cost in. Bear in mind that for a show with 15 entrants, um, you're gonna get about 225 pounds in from entry fees, depending on how much you charge. So keep that in mind when you're thinking, because the hall cost is gonna be your biggest cost. So have a look around, shop around. Um, it might take you a long time to find the perfect venue, but the venue is really, really important. Talk to other people as well. So like, if you want details about my haul, my haul is cheap, it's good. Just bring your own teaspoons, your own dustpan and brush, you'll be fine. I'll quite happily give it to people and other people have held shows there as well. It's a really great venue, I love it because it is cheap. Okay, so you've found your dream location. It's perfect in every single way. There's a hot tub included, it's wonderful. Um, you now need to write your schedule. Okay, so writing your schedule is really, really tough. Um, and what I would say before I say anything else is always get someone to proofread your schedule who's experienced with going to shows or experienced with running shows um, because they'll be able to spot any mistakes and they'll also be able to spot uh, whether there are any gaps. I quite impressively a few years ago managed to miss Warm Blood Sport Horse off my schedule, but thankfully um, Laura had proofread it for me. Uh, I actually did leave it off the photo show schedule and I'm really sorry. So kind of stuff like that, even if you're experienced, it's a really easy mistake to make. So it's really good to get someone to proofread it. The first thing you think, need to think about is your sections. So I'm gonna kind of assume now that most of you know the terminology. If you don't, head along to our website, there's a glossary, there's descriptions, there's everything you need to know to understand the terminology. A general show usually has three large sections, three small sections. Those large sections will be OF, custom, and then either CTF or artist resident China. Uh, CTF now is much larger than Artist Resin in China. So for my shows, I've pushed that up to a bigger section and AR into a smaller section. It's just a case of demand. And I know the AR people don't like it and it makes them sad and I'm sorry, but I don't make the rules. Other people want to show the horses. You'll need to think about whether you're gonna split CTF. So you can do a two-way or a three-way split. You might wanna do a three-way split. You might wanna do a two-way split. That's really controversial. People get very angry. Ugh, horrible. Um, you also need to think about whether you're going to have performance and workmanship and fun, or you, whether you're going to have specialist sections like animal artistry. Um, if you're going to run performance, please bear in mind that it takes a lot longer than the other sections. If you're going to run workmanship, make sure you also, if you're running breed classes, have sections for custom and AR. That only makes sense. Um, I've run it with um, animal artistry, not AR, because I did a Herefordshire show that worked fine. There were still lots of entries in workmanship but no one really wants to pack a load of horses just for workmanship. You kind of want to have more of a chance. So think about that as well. You need to think about when you're going to have championships. So are you just going to have section championships, which is the quickest way to do it, but the section championships will be larger. So there's less chance for people to win prizes, but the show runs quicker. Um, or are you going to have like mini divisional championships? So like five classes and then a championship. Obviously, if you're gonna do that, that's actually more expensive as well, because you need to provide prizes for that. So you need to keep that in mind. Um, and it does take longer. So bear in mind, every time you do a little divisional, that's an extra class on your class list. So when you're counting your classes, make sure you include those divisional championships, because they do take time to judge. Also try and split them evenly. That's quite important. You see some shows where one division has three and one division has 10. That doesn't really make much sense. Try and split them so they're reasonably even. That will make everyone happy. And then at the end, you've obviously got to make a decision as whether you're going to have a Supreme. Generally, I like to have a Supreme at my shows. And I think it's really nice. I like going to shows with Supremes. It's a nice round to the end. 
Some people don't like to include performance in the Supreme. I do. Just make sure it's really clear in advance so that if people don't pack up their performance entries, they know it's going into the Supreme. You then need to think about the actual classes. So um, this could be the, quite hard to do. As I said, make sure someone proofreads it. There is an example schedule on our website that you can use. But when you're writing a schedule, the best thing to do is to write it backwards. So this is my first like major top tip is write your schedule backwards. So start with the classes that like cover everything else. So the first one I would always start with is Young Stock and Foles. Now maybe that you're gonna split Young Stock and Foles up. If you are, then the class should be other Young Stock and Foles. Um, fantasy and Decorator. You don't have to include Fantasy and Decorator, not everyone does. Uh, it is a BMX qualifiable class. Um, it isn't obviously for Nan. Um, unless it's workmanship, but I always like to include it and I have 200 original Finnish fantasy and decorator models So please include it in your shows because it's really hard to show them all and I love it so much So definitely include it. Um, then you've got donkey, mule and exotic. Again, some shows do like to split up donkey, mule, exotic I've generally never felt the need. It always works perfectly well together um, you then want to think about the other classes. So I'd normally put in part bred horse or other part bred horse. So if you've got something like part bred Arab earlier on, you want other part bred horse and other part bred pony or part bred pony. You then want your other classes for your horses and your ponies. So other purebred pony and other purebred horse. Um, it may be that you're going to put these earlier in your set schedule. So maybe you put other purebred horse after your horse classes. And maybe you put other purebred pony after your pony classes. That's fine. It's best to write your schedule in a logical fashion for people. It makes it easier. Um, but you want to start with those. And then you can think about how many other classes you're going to include. So your other classes are split into different sections. The first section is light horse. The second section is American. The third section is heavy horse. And the fourth section is pony. Your fifth section is like everything else. So your part breads, your fantasies, your foals. You can of course put the foals in, in with the horses if you want. But. So start off with your light horses. All live shows must start with the Arab class. If you don't do that, people just completely lose their minds. What I would say about writing schedules is that people are creatures of habit. Um, and they also don't read, so they expect it to be like every other show that they've ever attended. You start throwing in fancy creative stuff, um, you just find that people just get really stressed because they just, people are just like, just want everything to be the same, which is really boring. But start with Arab. I just, I can't cope with live shows that don't start with Arab and I know other people can't either. So Arab um, and then other light horse classes you're going to think about thoroughbred, warm blood, um, maybe European light horse. Um, Iberian is quite a common one. The interesting thing about Iberian is it's quite a small class, so because it's literally just like Andalusian and Lusitano, um, but it is quite big as well, particularly with the new mini Alborezos, particularly in custom. In custom, it's huge now, so you know, it's still a good one to include. You might want to put part bread Arab in. Um, for American, as a general rule, there are like five that you must have. Always split your stock unless it's a section where there are going to be minimal entries. So for animal artistry, you might want to just have American or you might want to just have stock and then gated and then other or gated and then other. I don't know. I'm sort of writing schedules in my brain now. But for all the other sections, really, you want to have American quarter horse, Appaloosa paint. You want to have them all separate. I can tell you everyone has got those horses in their collection pretty much. So everyone's going to be showing them. They're quite often big classes. AR, sometimes they're a bit smaller, but and the same with custom, but for OF and CTF, they're usually quite big. You then want to add in a gated class. So um, there's a difference, obviously, between American gated and USA gated. American gated includes all of America. So that will include things like your Peruvian Pasos and your Paso Finos. A USA would just be things like Saddlebrides and Tennessee Walking Horses. North American arguably also includes Pasifinos, can come from Puerto Rico, and Puerto Rico is in North America, not South America. It gets complicated. So generally, just think really, really clearly in your brain, what do I want in this class? And make sure you're really, really clear with the terminology. If you're calling it USA Gated, you only want ones from the United States. If you're calling it North American, really, you're going to have your horses from Puerto Rico. Um, if you're calling it American, that's going to include all your South American. If you're in the States, that's completely different. Don't listen to anything I'm saying now. Just ignore me and go and make a rum or something. Um, 
You then want to have an other American. You might want to include something like a Mustang Feral. That's quite a common one to include. Um, some people like to include a just a pure Morgan class. Some people like to have a Morgan and National Show Horse class. That's quite a common one to have. But as long as you've got an other, that will sort of sweep up all those random American breeds quite nicely. Then you've got your heavy horses. I generally do a three-way split, I think works best for heavy horses. So I like to have my UK heavy. So you've got three breeds that would go in that. Then my European heavy, so all your Percherons and your Belgium drafts and all that kind of stuff. And then I normally have other heavy. And the reason I don't call it American heavy is because there are very few other heavy horses. There are a few, there's Australian Shires, there are quite a lot of Russian ones, but there are not really enough to make up a whole class. And when you're writing your class list, you want it to be balanced. You don't want really, really tiny horse classes and really massive classes. You want to try and even it out. There was always going to be some classes that are more full than others, but you want to try and split that up as much as possible. So I like other, because then you've got your North American spotted draft, your American cream drafts, and then all the random other things that someone has found in the breed book, probably Emma. Okay, and then you've got your ponies. I'm not going to go into too much detail and argue with people about British Native Pony, but um, if you've got British Native Pony, that's a good place to start. There are 13 official British Native Pony breeds, so you might want to split that up. You might want to have like Welsh and then other British Native or something like that. Bear in mind that if you just, again, you've got to think about your terminology. If it's just British ponies, that's different to British native ponies. British native ponies is very set. There are 13 breeds and it doesn't include anything else, even if they're native type. But British ponies would include British spotted ponies, things like Kerry Bog Pony, um, all those other breeds. It would include Hackney ponies, for example. Um, generally speaking, you might then have European ponies. So you normally do British native, then European. European would sweep up the rest of the British ones. So you'd have your Hackneys, your British spotted, your Kerry Bogs, um, your Lundy ponies, all those ones would get swept neatly into it. Um, and then an other pony. So other pony would normally include things like your pony of the Americas, all the sort of weird Asian ponies. There are loads of those so that all of those would get neatly swept in, beautifully sweep them all in. Um, Emma, do not start your live show schedule with Fantasy Decorator, I will cry. So, <laughs> I am checking your comments as I go through for questions. Um, then you need to move on and you've got all of your other stuff. So that's where you've got your part ponies, your other purebreds, your fantasy and your foals. You might want to split your foals up. Um, foals can be quite big classes, so it's sometimes nice to split it up. Sometimes you can do something simple like horse and pony and then other. Um, but then your other ends up really small, particularly in OF, because there aren't any donkey foals. Um, but so you could do like light horse and you could maybe say that other includes part bread. You could do light pony, part bread heavy, other, but then other ends up really small. So think about that. Make sure you do think about what people are going to be entering into the classes. And um, for OF, generally, it's always massive. The only exception is usually that other young stock. Um, there might not be any entries, but there would be in CTF, for example. There are loads of baby donkeys in CTF. Um, and obviously, custom, someone could have customised one. So you need to sort of keep all of that in mind. For example, animal artistry, you wouldn't split up your stock because there's only really one or two moulds that would be in that. Um, but there are quite a lot of Arab moulds and sort of Welsh moulds and native moulds. So you might split that up. So think about that as well. I know, it's all a bit too much. Then send it over to someone you know and trust and just get them to read through it. Um, you can just say, could you like, you know, spend half an hour and imagine where you were gonna put your showstring in this sh show? Does it all make sense? All that kind of stuff. I would then write at the bottom of your schedule, write a list of like all those really controversial, annoying breeds that people always ask about and tell people where to put them, because then what your entrance can do is completely ignore that list and ask you the questions anyway. So that's why it's fun, I love that. But you can be really snarky at them and be like, it's in the schedule, read it. Um, it's always nice if you do a little snarky. So you've done all of that. Whew, you're probably knackered by this point. You now need to write all of the extra stuff in. So this is not something that I thought I was going to have to have a conversation about with anyone, but apparently I do. You need to tell your entrance how much your show costs, how to pay you, where it is, and what time doors open. Your entrants do not need to be going on a weird and wonderful treasure hunt through your schedule to find these pieces of information. And I cannot emphasise how much of my life is wasted doing that. <sighs> Rant over. Lay it out really, really clearly. Lay out the time that doors open, the time that the show starts, 
lay out the location. It might want to be that at the end you put in some extra directions, but put the full address and postcode. If you don't have the postcode, get it because people need it. Assume everyone is using a sat nav. Um, make sure you've included how much the cost is, your payment terms and conditions. So are you going to be allow people to have refunds? Are you going to allow people to back out two minutes before the show and get a refund? No, you're not because you're sensible. Are you going to have a complete no refunds policy like we do? Go for it, do it, it changes your life. Um, you need to make sure that Oh, I've completely lost my train of thought. So entry costs and how to pay you. So make sure you've got your PayPal in there as well. We always put our address for checks as well. No one really pays by check anymore, but I like to give people that option because not everyone has PayPal. I don't like excluding people. Um, so make sure that's all really, really clear. You then need to include your rules. The most important rule is how many entries you're going to allow per class. Standard is three, but some shows allow unlimited. Don't do that, particularly if it's your first show. That would be insane. Um, three or four is normal. I would reduce that for performance and workmanship. Workmanship, um, you might want to reduce it down to one. Um, two is okay, and same with performance. Two is usually pretty standard. What you can do for workmanship is you can say one, and then you can say um, classes will be open for extra entries um, if they're small. So it may be that your other colour class, there are like three entries, and you can say on the day, you know, you can put more entries in to bulk this class out if you like. And it may be that one person has five entries, but at least it's bulked it out and it makes it a bit fairer. And usually no one will have an objection to you doing that. It just makes the, the classes run a bit smoother. Um, other rules are pretty standard. Make sure you think about your liability. Um, in terms of public liability, we have public liability insurance because we're a business. Um, check with your show hall what the liability arrangements are. Check if you do need public liability insurance. Um, your rules really just need to cover you. So they need to be about sportsmanship. They need to be about what are you going to do if people are nasty to each other? Um, things like no running, no dogs. Um, I was going to say no children then, but that's a really horrible rule. <laughs> Don't have that rule. Um, some people do run over 18 only shows. Um, so maybe include that because no over 18 only show. Things like that. Um, you'll find on most schedules for people who've been running shows for a really long time that there are some weird rules in there. And I can tell you now that from, from, no, I know from my own shows that those rules have like developed because issues have come up at shows that you just didn't even think about. And then you've had to put in as a rule for the next show. So have a look at other people's rules. Again, our sample schedule has rules on it that you can just copy and paste. Um, but make sure you read through them and make sure you check the terms and conditions of your hall. Um, if there are any sort of particular rules that you may want to make sure that people are aware of for your show hall. I'm going to have a quick drink. Uh, Emma's evil. Yeah, no, Emma, no, we're banning, we're banning you from attending shows or running them if you're going to do that. Okay, cool. The final thing you need to think about is are you going to raise money for charity? And if you are going to raise money for charity, what charity are you going to raise it for? Um, you probably already have an idea in your mind. So quite often people run shows because there's a charity they really support and they want to run a show um, for that charity. If you don't, and you don't know the charity, do please, and this goes for any charitable giving, make sure you do your research. Um, it should be a registered charity with the Charities Commission. Um, Google it and look up articles about it because it may be that it's quite controversial. It may be that some of their practices are not things you believe in. Check you know where that money is going. You can view their accounts online. You can see the percentage that that's actually going to the cause and the percentage that they're using on marketing and advertising and things like that. Um, really, really do your research. I have seen shows run for charities that are really bad. Um, and that are not reputable at all. And I know a lot of people fundraise for stuff that's really dodgy. So really think about that. Um, bear in mind that of course you can fundraise for non-charitable organizations. Those tend to be organizations that are, have um, political um, sort of affiliation. So you can't do political, uh, political activism and also be a registered charity, it's excluded. You can only be a registered charity if you hit one of 15 different criteria. You don't need to know that. It's under the Charities Act, you can look at that. Um, so like Amnesty International has two different bits. It has its political bit and its charitable bit. So if you're running, raising money for something like that, that's absolutely fine. There are lots of non-charitable organisations or non-governmental organisations, but just check the work they're doing. And again, check where that money is going and whether it's actually going to the cause or whether it's lining someone's pocket. Um, sadly, that's quite common. The Charities Commission doesn't really have any teeth. It's not very good. Um, so you do have to look those things up yourself. Emma, you run awful shows if they start with fantasy. 
Okay, so you've put that in, you've got your charity in there, you've told people you're gonna advertise, um, you're gonna raise money for charity, you're gonna have a raffle. Um, what do we do now? Well, we need to open for entries. And now we're gonna hit the massive pitfall that is people arguing over entries. So this is where my top tip of being clear, concise, and black and white comes in. First of all, if you're gonna BMEX qualify, you need to check the BMEX requirements. They do require you to be publicly advertised. Generally speaking, if you advertise your show on the list in the British Model Horse Collectors, then that's fine, that ticks that box. Um, if you put it on like a website or a blog that's publicly advertised, then obviously that's also publicly advertised, which you might do if you have your own website. Um, bit controversial in terms of like if your Instagram account was a public account, you put it on your Instagram that's public, I suppose technically that's public, but just have a look at what their rules are and make sure it is advertised properly. Make sure you list it on the list in the British Model Horse Collectors group. If you're not in that group, comment on the little thing and someone will put a link in, I'm sure. Um, that's the best group and it does have a list of all the shows. That will stop you from clashing with another show. I should have said that when you pick your date, you need to make sure you don't clash with anyone, that's really important. Um, and it will also mean that like no one else books a show on that day. So you've, you've got that date, once it's in that list, it's your date and anyone else who books a date on that show, on that date, that's their problem. Even if they run a show that weekend every single year, you don't necessarily have to know that and it is very much a first come first serve um, game when it comes to dates. Also bear in mind that, you know, if you're running a show in the south of England, they're running a show in the north of England, it's not really the end of the world because you don't have that same level of crossover. So think about that. Put it up there. Um, setting up a Facebook group is quite common now. It's quite a fun idea and it's quite a good idea. So maybe set up a Facebook group for your show. You can put your schedule and everything like that in there. And then running up to the show, you can share pictures of your prizes. You can give people information. You can upload things like the results and judging list and it just makes life a little bit easier because you don't have to email it to 15 people. You don't have to get GDPR consent because they're all just in the Facebook group and that makes life a lot easier for you. Um, so I would generally recommend setting up a Facebook group. Give it the title of your show so that when two weeks before someone who's an idiot like me realises they need to send the judging list in and they can't remember who's running the show or what's going on and they just type it into Facebook to try and find the Facebook group, they can find it. So that's a really good idea because most people are stupid. Just assume everyone is stupid. Um, then you need to think about when you're going to open for entries. A lot of shows now are selling out within minutes and this is causing problems because people are getting really angry that they can't get places on shows. So what I would recommend is that you announce when you're going to announce that you're going to open for entries. So say, you know, we are going to open for entries at 7pm on the 3rd of July, for example. Um, to get a place, um, you need to pay for your entry. My real big top tip is make people pay for their entry. Do payment secures place. It has honestly made life so much easier for me and I've been messed around a lot less. When I started running live shows, none of this was a problem. Um, shows didn't sell out as quickly. People didn't back out two minutes before. People paid their entry fee. People sent in their judging list. Um, it's 10 years ago now and it seems like another world. Now running shows, I get people backing out all the time. I get people like not wanting to pay. Um, you can give people a month in advance and then that will cover their payday. And if someone can't afford to pay for your show, that's not your problem. It's, you're not there to accommodate other people. Um, you know, you're there to run an efficient show and a well-run show and make it fair for everyone. So do it a month in advance and it covers everyone's paydays if you want. Um, make it payment secures place. And the other thing I would say is don't offer refunds. That has made a huge difference to my back out rate not offering refunds and yet occasionally some lovely person who's had something really horrible happen in their life loses £7.50 or £15 but it's not the end of the world if that happens. Black and white rules make things fair and they make things simple. That means that when so and so who backs out of every show at the last minute backs out and demands a refund you don't have to give them a refund. One or two people ending up, you know, nice people ended up being screwed over to protect you against the people who back out on a regular basis is fine and also you'll, what you'll find is people who are unable for whatever reason to really commit to shows and do back out will just not enter your show and yeah that's really sad for them and it's really hard but at the end of the day you'll find that you, all of your shows will have waiting lists and it, I think it's unfair when someone can't attend um, and they regularly do that and then people like on the, on, we're on the waiting list but it's too late and they're already doing stuff that weekend 
So think about that. I would say no refunds policy has honestly changed my show entries really, really well. It's made a huge difference. And saying payment only secures place has changed my show entries. Those are two policies I've put in place and they've made my life so much easier. And this is called secrets of a show host and secrets to making my life easier are very, very important. So open up your entries. Everyone's entering. You're really, really excited. Woo, you sold out your show in five minutes. Wow, that was stressful. Um, <laughs> woo. Um, now you need to think about all the stuff that you need to do before your show. First thing you need is a good record of everyone who's coming. So an Excel spreadsheet is your friend. Obviously, if you're a recording personal data, which does include people's names, you need to make sure that you get GDPR consent and their consent to store those names for a reasonable period and then delete it a reasonable period after your live show. Please make sure that you look at your data protection obligations. I record their name, whether they have paid or not, which will always be yes. Um, the payment type, um, if, they're, if I have different types, if I have full entry and part entry. Um, I will then, if they are not through Facebook, I'll record an email address so I've got something to contact them with. And then I have, and you'll see this one if you download our template, all these little squares that are numbered 1 to 150 going along in a row. And that's because I use that for my judging list. I normally also record whether they're eligible to judge and whether they've sent me a judging list. We can talk about judging lists further on. Further on, we've already been talking for 30 minutes. Okay, if you are wanting to run a BMEX qualifier show, then you will need uh, to do a BMEX application. You can download the application form on their website. Make sure you read it through if you're not familiar with their rules before you write your schedule. You can then fill it in. It's relatively simple and straightforward. You will need a backup show host. Now your backup show host is there for emergencies only. And I'm honestly not criticizing anyone for using a backup show host because I had to use one one year because I wasn't able to run a show four days beforehand. They are not there to run your show if you back out six months before. And they are not there to run your show, basically. Do everything. They are there to pick up the pieces at the last minute when you've been hit by a bus the day before or something horrific like that. Um, so you need to make sure that you've got everything in place. And that backup show host can't be a family member. They have to actually be a hobbyist. So someone is capable of running a live show. If you're under 18, there are rules about who, who runs the show. And there's lots of extra rules if you're under 18 and running a live show. So please make sure you read all those through. And then you can send off your BMEX application. How exciting. And now we move on to like the fun stuff, the really fun stuff. I don't know why I'm a sport sport. Okay, Emma, okay, Emma and Curtis want a seminar that we're not going to do. Um, right, so you can now think about prizes. This is so much fun, I love doing prizes. So as a basic rule, one of the prizes you're gonna have for all your classes is certificates. And there are three different types of certificates you can do. You can do a type like this, and I call this the insanity certificate. So these are ones that are beautifully handmade and look really, really pretty, but will have to be cut out individually by hand. If you've never had a blister from scissors from cutting out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of small shield shapes, then honestly, what are you doing with your life? You haven't lived. I have an actual scar. For those of you who maybe have a bit more money to spend and less time, the pre-printed certificate is a really good option. Don't include your show name and then you can use them at future shows. Really, really good option if you're going to run lots of shows and you're short on time. Basically, they're business cards and you can just get them pre-printed. They're more expensive, but a really great idea. Printed ones that you use that square and you just use a guillotine to cut up are a really good idea. If you don't have a guillotine, you can get them really, really cheap. I'm talking about the little ones, not the ones we use to execute French people. Um, this one is quite simple it's just got like the show name on the back um, and then it's got some sweets on the front and the placing um, you need to think about your colors you can google those um, standard uk colors are red blue yellow green and then whatever you want basically after that i do orange and then purple because that's normally what i see at shows um, but you can sort of once fifth and uh, once fifth is over you can just like do whatever you want from fifth you might want to place the tenth no reason why you can't it's a bit of a fifty faff um, but you can um, you can either print certificates on your home printer. I use a printing company because it's actually cheaper. Um, so I just pay a printing company and they'll uh, basically it's an A4 sheet. Um, this one would have had 12 certificates on, um, but something like that, there would have only been six. And then I get them and I can just cut them out at home. And you can see they're quite a thick card. 
Um, whatever you use, you need to be able to write on it. So make sure it's not shiny or glossy and someone can write on it really easily with a pen. Um, I don't like shows that just give you like a first to sixth ribbon. Um, those are really pretty, uh, but they're a pain to store because they fall out the files and you can't write on them. And most people, that's how they keep their results is that they've written on their certificate. Um, Curtis, don't, there is lit, Curtis, if you want to start a petition, there's literally a thing on a website for you to vote on. Um, so you've got certificates. Now for champions, you might want to also do certificates. If you're only doing small sections, you might just do certificates. But then you also want to think about rosettes. And this is a sneak peek. Um, unfortunately, Recycled Live is probably not going to happen. And we all, we all know that. And that's not scary new news. Um, but I bought these rosettes. Um, I've got a nice deal on them. They're made by uh, my favourite rosette maker, Inspiration Rosettes. And this is a really nice Supreme Champion rosette. So obviously you need to think about your budget. So how much are you going to spend on your rosettes? But then you can get really creative. Think about the theme for your show. Um, for like Hereford Alive, we had Hereford Cattle on the middle and I loved it. I really love fancy ribbons. So these are stripey and I love the spotty ones as well. You might want to have big rosettes, little rosettes. Just think about your budget. So generally speaking, you want to have Supreme Reserve and Reserved Reserve all have rosettes. And Section Champions <coughs> should all have rosettes. I do section champion, reserve, 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 all get rosettes. If I'm doing little divisional championships, I just do rosettes for the champions because it is quite pricey buying rosettes. Um, and it's quite nice and we all love doing it. But at the end of the day, you do have a budget you need to work for. You might want to think about other prizes as well. I quite like giving prizes to my section champions that are themed. So this little guy, for example, would be quite a fun prize for like the CTF champion. Um, I quite often give like customs for the custom champion and stuff like that. You can give uh, trophies. So, um, wow, this is a very old trophy. It's 13 years old. But you could give a nice little trophy like this. Or you can get big trophies. You can get glassware. And you can go completely avant-garde, which I know lots of you will know I do, and give people teapots or cuddly teddy bears or statues of golden retrievers or coffee cups or all kinds of weird and wonderful things that you can do as prizes. If you make something, so if you're a customizer or a tack maker, or you make props, or maybe you make something that's nothing to do with model horses, you can give those as prizes, you give vouchers, you could ask people to sponsor, so some people might want to sponsor and give prizes. It doesn't have to be model horse related, you can just have fun with it and do something different and creative. You can just like do what you want, you know? Um, and think about rosettes, they don't have to be massive. Look at this little guy, it's tiny. This is a little tiny, tiny, tiny rosette from the year 2000. <laughs> wow, okay. So yeah, prizes, get creative, write a budget. You might want to subsidise them from your own pocket. I always subsidise. We don't need to talk about how much I spend each year on giving people prizes at my shows, but it is a lot of money. Um, but you can get really creative and have fun with it. You then need to think about peripherals. And I've got all of this stuff here. And basically I'm going to go through and tell you what it is and why you need it. Um, so if you're running a raffle, you're going to need cups. Um, so basically what people do is they tear their raffle tickets and they put it in the item they want. You'll have seen that in most live shows. Um, you can buy these pretty cheaply in like pound stores and stuff like that. Um, I recommend getting some if you're going to run lots of shows because it stops you from like digging around in cupboards to find cups at the show hall. Um, you can get a little themed ones as well if you want to go really cute. Um, don't worry too much about using plastic ones because at the end of the day you're going to reuse them at every single show you run. You then want to think about what people are going to write their breed on. And you've got two real options. The most common option is to use post-it notes or ripped up pieces of paper. Scrap paper works perfectly well from this. If you've got bits of scraps from where you've cut certificates out, for example, put them all in a box and that will save, you know, them going in the recycling. Um, but you can buy post-it notes relatively cheaply, standard post-it note. The other option is to use laminated um, tickets. And these are something that we started doing last year. They've been really, really popular. We always provide post-it notes as well, so if people don't want to use these, they can. With these, you need to give stuff so people can wipe them off. So we provide um, little microfiber cloths. The pens themselves actually have wipey bits on and they work really well. And we always have wet wipes as well to make sure that no one has the pen on their fingers. And all people do is they write their breed on 
Um, this says A, so assume a Welsh section A, and then when they're finished, they can obviously scrub it off like that. Um, and then it's gone and they can reuse it. Um, so if you're running lots of shows, this is a really good alternative. So although the laminated um, paper obviously can't be recycled because I'm using it every single show, it's a slightly better alternative in terms of the planet. And um, these little markers were not very expensive and they've got little rubby bits on top and they've got magnets. So you can stick them on stuff. I don't know what you'd be sticking them on. I don't think they actually don't. There you go, look, you can stick them on, stick them on a pot. Oops. don't mind. Okay, ring pens. If you're gonna run lots and lots of shows, this is my other live show, top tip hack. Get custom printed pens that say, I've stolen a ring pen. I have only ever lost two of these, only. Now the person who nicked one, you know who you are. The other person who nicked one was me. Uh, so <laughs> that's fine. I mean, I steal my own pens. Um, I have thousands of these, by the way, and I give them out for free to show holders. So if you're running a show, um, just get in contact with me and I will happily give you some because I've got millions. Um, also make sure each of your entrants has a pen. So just buy some cheap generic black biros um, and just put them on each of the tables. That will just stop pen theft. I say that you should have three per ring and that's usually a good number because you'll have multiple people writing. If you're running a raffle, you'll need raffle tickets. Um, I buy these as job lots online. I have thousands. I cleared all my stuff out and I've literally got like 30 books of raffle tickets. Always buy more than you think you'll need because you'll always run out if you don't. Um, when you're running your first ever live show, all this stuff really does add up in terms of costs. But bear in mind that you're going to be able to reuse it at future shows. So don't worry too much. Um, you might want to also think about sweets as prizes. So these are some random sweets that I found at the bottom of the box. I'm going to make you all eat next year, so uh, warning for that. I have these as well that I got for my first ever live show. These are judges' rosettes, so the judge can wear those. Particularly good if you've got a judge that's judging whole sections. That's quite fun. Um, signs are really important. These are not actually my ring signs. I thought they were. Um, but make little signs to put in the rings that say like ring one, ring two, ring three. You can get really, really creative with those. Um, you might also want to think about having a bridesmaids raffle. We're not going to talk too much about that. Okay, so that's like some of the peripheral other stuff that you're going to need. Make sure you've also got sort of general stationery. So make sure you've got some sellotape and some scissors. I would also say bring spare certificates and some spare rosettes because if there has been an issue, like check them when you get them, then you've just got something as like a backup just in case. So just think about how you can have like spares and think about all the things that you might want to think about. And bin bags are the other big thing. Recycling bags and bin bags, you'll need those for when you tidy up your hall. So raffle, that's the other really, really fun thing. Um, you'll want to start getting raffle prizes pretty, pretty quickly. You might want to um, acquire stuff yourself, but also you can put an advert out and ask people for donations. You might want to contact businesses and say, hey, I'm running a show in aid of this charity, could you donate? Generally speaking, everyone who comes to your show will bring a raffle prize. So you can also rely on that to help you fill out your raffle. Um, I normally raid like local charity shops and stuff like that and find like little things to put in the raffle. I normally go to like the cheap discount stores like B&M home stores and stuff like that um, to buy chocolate. As a general rule, I always make sure there's wine and chocolate in the raffle. Those are like the two things and a cuddly toy. If I don't put a cuddly toy in the raffle, Brendan refuses to come and help at the show. So I have to put a cuddly toy in. I might as well just buy him a cuddly toy, but you know, anyway. So things like that are quite good raffle prizes. Make sure there's at least one model horse in the raffle. Um, but people are happy to pay for raffle tickets. You know, even if the raffle isn't massive and amazing, you'll go to some shows, you see huge raffles, and you'll be like, oh my God, my show didn't have that. I feel really sad. Um, but don't, people will happily buy raffle tickets, even if it's a small raffle. So don't worry too much. Yeah, Marion, um, drop me a message next year. I can't, I can't remember the date for springtime next year. Um, but yeah, I'll bring them along because I normally come to springtime. Um, you just have to remind me like literally the day before and I'll bring you the pens. Okay, so you've got your raffle, you've got your cups for your raffle. You've got 18 million books of raffle tickets. It's the week before the show. You think you've got everything done, but you haven't. 
you're really tired, you're really stressed, you're really worried, it's your first show, ah! what do I need to do a week before? The first thing you need to think about doing is your running order. I actually did this a bit before the week before, but I'm going to talk about it like in the context of judging lists. You don't need to do it until a week before in that sense, but if you want to do it before, do. Running orders are really, really important because they're what make or break a show in terms of how efficiently it runs. We're going to talk more about how you can make or break your show by how efficiently it runs and how important that is. But your running order is really, really important. There are some general rules that you need to follow. The first is that performance should always go first. Performance takes forever. You have two options with performance. You either run it across three rings and watch people cry. If you're a sadist, I highly recommend that. Or you run it in one ring and then just do like a small section after it. I think the running it in one ring and having a small section after it is quite a good idea because it just stops performance shows from stressing and trying to put entries in three rings at the same time, which is going to slow your show down. What you want is for performance to go as quickly as possible so it's out of the way and the annoying performance shows that take ages are done. One top tip when you're running performance is to put a deadline in, so add that into your rules and say like you've got five minutes to set up or ten minutes to set up. And if you don't set up by that time, then the class will close. That's quite a good thing to put in place. It's something BMX has in place. It's something we put in place after we had problems one year. So think about that as an option. Another rule is that if you're running workmanship, it should run at the beginning don't run it at the end because everyone packs their horses and we all do it, even though we know there's a workmanship section, we'll still pack horses that we want to put in workmanship. So run it at the beginning and don't clash it with custom and AR. When you clash it with custom and AR, people will have horses in all the classes. So if you're running workmanship and you're running performance, I would put like performance in ring one and workmanship over rings two and three and then put custom and AR directly after workmanship. And you could maybe, you might have to split OF up a little bit at the end of the show, like put it after in ring one or something, OF's hard because it's going to be your longest section. So think about how long sections are going to take. OF and CTF are going to be your longest breed sections. Performance is going to take forever. Workmanship can take a long time as well because it's a long time to judge because the classes are really competitive. So you need to think about all those things when you're running your running order. Write your running order up. Type it up in a nice spreadsheet. So have the ring and um, the like, class number and the class name and then put a column in for judge because the next thing you're going to do is your judging list. Now I've done a detailed blog post on how I do my judging list so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on that here. Basically you've got to find a way that works for you and everyone works in like different ways and the way I work works really well. So what I do is I have my spreadsheet with all of my entrants and then I have the class numbers all along here in columns. And as people send me their judging lists, I cross off, so I put little X's in the classes they can't judge. Then when I'm doing my judging list, I've got a list, and the first thing I will do is I'll go through and find are there any classes that only one person can judge or nobody can judge. If it's a class that no one can judge, I withdraw my entry, and obviously I'll judge it because I'm the show host, and it's my obligation to judge classes that no one else can. If it's a class with only one person, obviously I'll put that person down to judge. That might be me, it might be someone else. And then I basically work through. So I've got my ring one, ring two, ring three, and I'll start here and I'll take the first person off the list. And every time I give someone a class, I have written on a notepad, I have all the names, and I just put like a little tally. And so I try and even it out so that everyone has the same number of classes to judge. And that makes life much, much easier. My pro tip for judging lists is to be strict. Tell people a deadline. If they do not get their judging list in by that deadline, just be nasty to them. Like I do potato shaming and it genuinely works. Like I'm really aggressive to people about it and they get their judging list in and then they get really sad if they don't because I put a really angry potato on their table and like a literal potato and then they get confused. Um, I might actually start making them wear hats with like potato shame written on, that might work as well. Yeah, put them in dunce hats, public shaming, it's a great idea. Just be really, really strict. As with everything, have like a deadline and make people stick to it. And if they don't stick to it, keep them in at lunchtime to do it. So pro teaching tip for you today. So just be strict, be black and white, and that will hopefully get everyone in. I know how bad I am at, at sending and judging lists, so I I'm fully accept that, that is a flaw as a human being. But if people are mean to me, then I usually do it. Okay. Once you've done that, you can turn that into your results sheets. So just get rid of the judges' names, add in some extra columns, so you have like first place and second place, 
And then I usually copy and paste it into Microsoft Word, or I just I I can fault, like make the formatting work for me so that it prints it. And I'll have um, A4 sheet, and it will have the name of the class in first place and second place. I also print my running orders for each ring. So it'll say ring one, and then it will have the class name and the judge. I have those printed out and I have them at the ends of each of my rings on a little table. So I have those spare tables to use. That will make my life easier on the day because I don't have to carry any extra pieces of paper around. I can walk up and down the rings and I always mark them off. So I like cross them off on the piece of paper and then other people can see where we're up to as well, which makes things a lot easier. So get those printed, put a little staple in them, nice and neat and tidy. Um, you also want to make sure your certificates are obviously cut out and organised and your BMEX tickets are organised. So your BMEX tickets, I would organise them in order per ring. So if you've got like, say, performance and then CTF, you could have, you have your little pile of performance and your little pile of CTF underneath. But three piles, one for each of your rings or two if you've only got two rings. With certificates, you've got two options. You can split them before the show into first to sixth. That's quite time consuming. You can put them in envelopes with the BMX tickets. Again, it's quite time consuming and it creates quite a lot of waste. I just now just have piles of first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and people can just pick them up. I keep the championship ones on my table and then I can hand them to people along with the rosettes or any prizes when the championships are being judged. So I find that works really, really well. Obviously for recycled live, because I hoard them in advance, I've got these little, ooh, baskets um, and they go in the center of the table in the little baskets if you think one of my shows you'll do that make sure you've got your running orders for each of the rings you've got your judging list for each of the rings you'll need to do entry packs so for the entry packs i normally just include the judging sheet and then i normally do a cover sheet with the person's name because i pre-assign seating um, make sure if they're judges, you go through and highlight what classes they're judging. That just makes it easier for them. They might never look at it, but at least you've given it to them and they've got it. Um, make sure you've got enough blank pens, so standard pens that each entrant can have a pen. If you're doing goodie bags, make sure you've got your goodie bags. Make sure you've been through your checklist. You've got everything ready and packed and organised. All your raffle prizes are in one box, all your prizes are in another box, all your extra stuff is in another box. If you run shows regularly, you'll just have a box of all of this stuff. So I just have a box that has all this in. The final thing you're going to need to do is to go food shopping. How exciting. Now, very few live shows offer lunch, but if you do offer lunch, you're offering that as an additional, um, I'd offer that as an additional extra just because people with dietary requirements, sometimes it's quite annoying if you've got to pay for lunch and you can't eat it. So just offer that as an additional extra. Um, if you're not, the only real requirement for you to provide are four things tea coffee milk and sugar those four things your milk can be almond milk or oat milk or goat's milk or cow's milk or any type of flipping milk that you want but those four things are what you must provide if other people have dietary requirements regarding milk and want oat milk and stuff like that it's really on them to bring it but those four things coffee tea milk sugar you need to provide you will also probably need more than you think you'll need um, make sure you buy stuff that you will use. So if you are vegan, don't feel like you have to buy cow's milk. People will quite happily drink oat or almond milk or not soy milk, soy milk is very bad for the environment. Um, and you can tell people in advance that you're only providing that and they can just bring their own cow's milk if they want, if they really care that much. You might want to also provide some like snacks. Um, what I would say is if it's the summer, and it's a day like today, do provide some form of cold drink. Yes, people can drink tap water, but sometimes they don't want to. So you can get really cheap cartons of orange juice. You can get squash or cordials. You can go really posh if you want to, if you've got a nice big budget or you want to spoil people. Um, but that's a really nice alternative. It's also a nice alternative people are bringing like young children. You can buy big bottles of fizzy lemonade. That's sometimes quite good. Towards the end of the day, people need a bit of sugar hit. So having some fizzy lemonade is quite important. Um, you could obviously provide decaf as well as caffeinated or herbal teas if you want. In terms of snacks, my general thing is I'll always get like a big multi bag of crisps. Uh, I have a one rule, which is that I won't buy anything that I won't eat myself because when there's stuff left over, I don't want to be left over with things I don't want to eat. So I now just buy like junk food that I don't normally buy because I'm like, I'm not going to buy that. I'm going to be nice and healthy. I buy it all for my live show and hope people don't eat it because then I get to eat it. Um, like things like dips and crisps and little like dippy things, um, snacks and stuff are really popular. You want to buy some fruit, grapes are quite a popular one. Again, in the summer, you might want to think about like things like strawberries. Um, 
a quite a fun little thing to have. You can bake, bake your own cupcakes, bake your own cakes, all that kind of stuff, gingerbread, flapjacks. Just, you know, think about what people want. I think sometimes it's really tempting to be like, oh, people want healthy stuff. No one wants healthy stuff at live shows. And if you do, you're weird. Okay, live shows are our day off from diet. So our day off from eating healthy or caring. You know, we just want to eat a ton of sugar. And quite frankly, if you've got a class list of 200 classes, I need sugar to get me through. So yeah, just buy unhealthy food. It's fine. Um, pro tip, get a little piece of paper and write milk in big letters and stick it to your front door because you will forget the milk when you leave in the morning and you do not want to have to go out and buy extra milk and be left with four pints of milk at home. So just remember your milk. So you've got everything organised, all your food is organised, it's all hidden away from spaniels um, and you've got it all nicely boxed and you're ready to go. You might want to pack your car the night before. Don't forget to pack your own horses by the way. I should say the week before you need to pack into your own showstring, don't forget that. Um, or you might need to just get up early on the day and pack everything into your car on the day. It really depends. So when it comes to setting up and cleaning up, my biggest tip is to find some people to help you. Um, call in favours, ask family members, um, get your husband to do it every single time. Um, my dad loves helping and I will tell you a little secret here. The reason my dad loves helping clean up after live shows is because he knows that he will get loads of the leftover food. So the first thing he does is he really subtly walks in the kitchen and he looks over and if you've seen the Lucna Hall, it has a serving hatch. He'll look over and he'll be like, oh, is the show, is the show going well, Katrina? Yeah, the show's going well. And you can see him, he's like eyeing up all of the food you guys have brought because he's like, mm, I have that, I have that. And my mum will be going, no, 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 we don't want any of the snacks. You know, we're on a diet. We don't want any of the snacks. And then he'll take home like a massive tray of chocolate cupcakes. He loves it, really. So you can bribe them with stuff like that. Obviously, they are doing a huge favour in helping you set up and helping you clean up. Um, so, you know, give them something in return, like leftover food um, or, you know, something else. But again, like part of being in a marriage is that you support each other and Brendan completely gets that it's something that's really important to me and he loves it really because he gets a cuddly toy at the show. So it's fine. Curtis wants pizza. We did do pizza one year and it was actually amazing. Um, and it's become a thing now that we order Domino's. Um, obviously not all show halls have Domino's but lots of people order that as their lunch. Don't feel like you're obligated to do that as a show host, it's quite expensive. So, you get to your hall. I'm going to talk you through like what my routine is when I set up on, set up on show day. So the first thing I do is I usually arrive about 6.45, 7. I get all my tables out and all my chairs out. I'm really used to my hall. I know my hall. I have two helpers. I have Laura and Brendan who are amazing and they know the routine. So Brendan empties the car. Laura and I get tables out. We generally just like pile them into the centre of the hall and then we organise them. Again, we know what our layout is so we can get it done pretty quickly. And then we put two chairs by each of the tables. And at this point, um, Brendan and Laura normally do like the kitchen um, um, or the raffle. And then I unpack things like the entry packs and the prizes because I know what's going on with that. So I'll normally then place the entry packs on each of the tables. Now I pre-assign seating. And the reason I pre-assign seating is because it allows me to separate those two people that hate each other. Or if I've had people like message me, like, can I sit next to so-and-so? Can I sit next to so-and-so? I can actually organize that myself. Um, and that makes it a lot better. I also know who brings like way more horses than they should. So I can make sure that they get a table that's maybe got a bit more space. Um, and stuff like that. So that's why I pre-assign seating because it gives me the chance to accommodate for all of those things that maybe as entrance you don't realise that people have asked for loads of different accommodations. You don't know that so-and-so has to sit next to a power plug at each show because they're, you know, their parent always uses their computer. You don't know that so-and-so's got a wheelchair or so-and-so has a dog or this or that. I know all of that stuff as I'm a show host so it makes it easier if I can pre-assign that seating and make sure everyone goes where they need to go. So I'll put their entry packs out, I'll put their goodie bags out if they've got goodie bags. Um, in the rings I have a table at the end and that's another pro tip. If you've got small tables, put one at the end of each ring and that means if people are writing it doesn't wobble the table. I'll have a running order, I'll have my judging list, I'll have my pile of BMX cards and then I'll have my six piles of certificates, so first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. I'll have three pens per ring. I will have, um, if I'm doing these, I'll have a selection of these pens and a packet of these and I'll have a wodge of post-it notes on each ring and also a microfiber cloth on each ring as well and I'll normally have a table with 
these on for people to use. Um, I will have a prize table and on my prize table I will create neat piles with all my certificates and my rosettes if I've got space. Not all show halls have space to do that so I've normally got it like on a pile on the floor. And my prizes. I always like if I can to have the supreme like rosettes and trophies and prizes laid out so people can see them because it looks pretty if you do. Um, and then you've got to do a raffle. So get everything unpacked for the raffle, put a cup in front of each item and then leave spare cups. You need to have all of that done before people start arriving. So I leave an hour and a half, which I think is a good amount of time. I'm really strict. So I say like doors open, don't, you know, they open at 8.30, don't come in before 8.30. Um, by the time people are coming in, I'm normally like nearly completely unpacked with my own horses. Um, and that means that I can greet people. Obviously, Brandy does most of that. But then if it, particularly if there's new people coming, I can meet them and I can show them what's going on and stuff like that. Um, Brendan obviously usually does the Chestnut Ridge stock, but that's something else that I have to think about because I'm running a business at the same time. I have to think about unpacking all of that. So it's all unpacked. Everyone's arrived. Everyone's unpacking um, their horses. Um, there's a discussion going on about Domino's and what Teresa's having for dinner. Great. Wonderful. Lovely. Um, you're ready to start. So the show will start usually an hour after doors open. Hour is a really good time. Half an hour is just too little. 45 minutes is okay. Hour, perfect. So you'll need to announce, say, hello, my name is Katrina and I'm, I'm your show host today. Point out where the kitchen is, invite people to help themselves to tea or coffee. Really good idea because once someone like asked me to make them a tea or coffee and it wasn't my show and I was just in the kitchen and then they tried to pay me for it, which was very weird and they didn't really understand what was going on. So announce it to people, point out where the toilets are, make sure you let people know where the fire exits are and they need to leave in the event of a fire. It's part of your obligations as a show host. Um, remind judges that they need to sign their BMEX cards. Remind entrants they need to write their results down and if they don't, they're not eligible for BMEX. Um, if you've got any other things that you want to talk to people about, so like I normally for Recycled Live remind judges that they just pick any certificates they want, but at the same time, don't spend eight hours trying to find a pretty one, just take the first one you pick up. Um, anything else you want to talk through, tell people there's a raffle at lunch, stuff like that. Get on, done, and then open the show. It's obviously going to be starting with Arab in all three rings, not anything else. Um, and then it comes on to how you make sure the show works for you and works really, really well for the day. And I'm going to have a drink and then I'm going to have a go at you all about stewarding. I really should have got water and not this fizzy. But. Okay, so what makes a good live show is a good host that stewards. If there is one rule, and if you can even if you get everything else wrong, do not break the golden rule. And the golden rule is there should be no class that is not either being judged, cleaned up, or put entered. Any class stood there without, be, without judging happening, or without people putting horses in, or without people putting, taking class horses out, is stale and it's wasting time. If you want a show to run efficiently, that should never happen. You shouldn't be allowing that to happen. And if you want to make sure that everyone is pissed off, allow that to happen because that will cause pissed off murmurings. I can guarantee you there will be people sat there going, I'm watching that class and nothing has happened in 10 minutes. If a judge is judging in another ring, judge the class yourself. Simple as that. Get things moving. My rule is I walk up and down the classes. So I walk from here to here and back again. And I watch each of those classes. So I know, I say, right, ring one is being judged. Ring two, people are putting their entries in. Okay, I'll put my entry in as I go up. Ring three, people are clearing. Make sure you're calling every single class, calling those judges. So as you go through, you say, okay, ring three, OF Arab has been judged. It's OF Thoroughbred next. Can you please bring your entries to the table? Once everyone's entries are in, okay, Emma, you can come and judge OF Thoroughbred. That is your punishment for making fantasy first at your show. So you can then call your judges. Don't expect your judges to know what they're judging. That's not their job. They're doing you a favor by judging. And yes, we all have an obligation to judge at shows. And I do get really annoyed when people refuse to judge, but you need to make sure because you are the show host that you get people in and they are judging. It's your job to keep that show moving. Nothing should ever be sat stale. If you're sat down and there are classes, then nothing is happening. 
everyone can see that and everyone is getting disgruntled because large class lists and every show nowadays has a large class list mean long days and people don't want to be stuck there forever they want things to have pace and they want it to move obviously you don't want it to move too fast there is a balancing act but you need to keep that pace going throughout the day and that's why my shows always finish at like 3 30 4 o'clock 4 30 and not at like 7 8 o'clock at night it's because i keep that pace up despite that i've got a huge class list and i don't sit down and i just drink a ton of red bull and just go for it so keep going throughout um, and making sure that you're keeping that pace. Chase people as well. Don't, don't think it's bad to chase people. People will get stressed and they will snap at you, but that's fine, just ignore them. Like it's their job to get their horses in the ring. Um, but call clear and call loud and call at least three times. Quite a lot of judges you'll find will call as well. So you do keep reminding people and if people have missed it, people have missed it. It's annoying, but it actually happens. Yeah, I know. Okay, right. Well, you can judge it OF warm blood then, Emma. That will be your punishment. Anyway, so keep it moving. Um, if you keep doing that, your show will run really, really efficiently. You need to think about when you're going to have lunch and how long lunch is going to be. Um, generally speaking, it's nice to have it like after a section championship, but that's not always possible. So try and break somewhere that feels sensible. Allow people to put sales in the rings at lunchtime. You might have a few lunchtime fun classes if you've included that. Um, Raffles can take a really long time. So look at your raffle and if it's as big as it was at Herefordshire Live last year, you might want to be thinking, okay, we're only going to have like half an hour for lunch because this raffle is going to take half an hour. If you're really behind with your schedule, again, you might want to make lunch a bit smaller, shorter. But bear in mind, people do need a rest. People do need to eat. Um, people still want to browse sales. They might need to go out and walk their dog. They just might want to get some fresh air, go out for a cigarette, whatever. So keep that all in mind. Do allow people enough time to do that. Then you're going to run your raffle. Um, try and keep, again, pace, 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 pace. Move, 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 move. Get through it, particularly if it's a big raffle. Far too time consuming raffles. And then you've got your afternoon. So just pace, 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 pace all the way through your afternoon. It will go quicker than you think. I think sometimes we think you can look at lunchtime and be like, oh my God, I've still got this to go. Um, but actually I've, I've never found that I've had a show that went on forever that I've been hosting. I've just, I've always managed to keep that pace up. Once the show is over, this is where your amazing backup team will come in and uh, help you clear up. If you don't have an amazing backup team, get one. Um, it's really, really helpful if you've got people to help you clean up because you've been on your feet since probably about 5.30 in the morning. And you've got to pack up all of your horses as well. So if you can get people to come in and pack up. If you're a show entrant, by the way, like if you've got time, if you've got a long journey home, then that's fine. Like see if you could maybe help out and say to them, oh, do you want me to clear away a few tables or put away a few chairs? It may be that it's not possible. Um, don't sit a slow packer in front of the cupboard. That's my other pro tip. Know people who pack away efficiently and do not put them in front of the cupboard. Um, and, you know, ask them, yeah, they, you know, if you can do that, that's really great. Thank you. That's really helpful and stuff like that. So other people are usually really helpful. Um, collect all your rubbish. Make sure you're, once you've cleared away, you've swept your hall. Leave your hall really, really neat and tidy because you want to make a good impression, particularly if it was a nice hall. And bear in mind that, you know, someone's going to be coming in the next day and using it. And people are really bad at cleaning halls. Like I found some gross stuff in our live show hall and it really upsets me when I find gross stuff. So just, yeah, clean, make it nice. Um, just make sure everything's pretty afterwards. And then go home and have a takeaway and drink half a bottle of rum because you've probably earned it and deserve it. Which brings us on, oh gosh, I've been talking for an hour and 45 minutes, to the final thing, final thing in terms of show hosting, which is your post-show stuff. And actually there isn't too much to do post-show. What I would say is to make sure you clean up like and unpack your boxes as quickly as possible. Um, I have been definitely guilty of leaving food in boxes and not realising, so just make sure you clean through them. Um, type up the results really, really quickly. If you just get them done, then they're done. Um, if you've made sure that you've done it in like a spreadsheet, then you just need to type it into a spreadsheet. You can use computers for results on show day, lots of people do that. But definitely will make your life easier afterwards. If people refuse to use the computer, make them. Um, it's just silly, quite frankly. People can use computers and they're just being pathetic, right? They're using computers to use Facebook so they can use computers to type a few things in during a live show. I won't accept excuses anymore. I'm being mean. I'm mean me today. 
Uh, post them onto your Facebook group for people to check. I normally think two weeks is a good time to let people check. Do a final call for like the missing results um, before you like submit them to BMEX. So do a call and say, look, we're still missing those. Champion results don't matter. It's only the first and second that matter. So those are the ones you want to chase. Um, be prepared to have your spelling corrected because people's handwriting is awful. Um, so I'm forever having to like retype because I've tried to read someone's handwriting and they're weird foreign name pause um, and it hasn't made any sense. And they're like, no, you spelled that completely wrong. And that's because they've written it as a scribble. Um, so be prepared to deal with stuff like that. Um, I normally highlight it on the squares on Excel. So I normally, if they're um, empty, so I'll like highlight them in yellow. And if I'm missing like a name, so an entrant name or horse name, I'll normally highlight it in red. Give, do that final call, give people a couple of days. Once it's done, say, look, I'm submitting it to BMEX at like 7 p.m. on Tuesday. If you're not in by then, then, you know, I'm sorry, you've missed it. Um, but as long as you give people time. I did go to a show once where she just posted, I've submitted the results and she didn't give anyone a chance to check, which is really not on because um, it's really easy to miss results. So do give people that check time. It's accommodated for in the BMEX application process, so do allow it. Make sure they're submitted within the deadline, which I think is 60 days for BMEX. Um, so just like set a reminder on your phone. It's quite easy to forget sometimes. Get them off, get them done. They're into the ether, they're gone, wonderful. And you're done. Uh, count up your money, put a little announcement in, donate it to the charity. Don't feel bad if like me, you can't get to a bank for like four months and then eventually get to a bank and put it in. Um, we're, we're not going to talk about the fact that I submitted a charity donation for Recycled Live like two days ago because I never did it. Awkward. But it is really hard to get to banks nowadays. So that's fine. Um, yeah, it's really hard. Actually, we just need to take payments electronically. It would make life a lot easier. So feel bad about that. Okay. So the final thing we're going to talk about is the drama llamas. Unfortunately, and like with every hobby, our hobby is plagued with a small number of people whose sole purpose in life seems to be to make everyone else's lives miserable. And we all feel sorry for them and we pray for them that their lives are so sad and lacking in meaning that the only way they can get fulfillment is to just be annoying um, and horrible to other people. So how do you deal with that? It's gonna come up in two places. It's either gonna come up on the show day or it's gonna come up after the show. Now it can come up in two ways. It could be raised to you directly or it might be raised indirectly. Um, it might be that something happens that's completely just out of your control. So in terms of show day, there are two things that are gonna happen. You're gonna either get criticism of judging results on the day or murmurings. Murmurings are most common. You can spot the murmurings because it's normally me. It's normally me and Emma like me, 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 me. Um, we're usually actually bitching about someone who's not there, it's fine. Um, so look for murmurings. It may, if that's happening, just ignore it, quite frankly. Um, it may be that someone approaches you with a genuine concern. If someone approaches you with a concern about a judge on the day, the best way to handle it is to wait until they judge another class and then approach them and ask them to talk through their placings. This obviously works a lot better if you entered the class and you want to know why your horse didn't place. But the best way to catch out someone who is um, not judging properly is to ask them to explain why they place the horses. So just do it in a really friendly fashion. Say, hey, could you just tell me why you placed like that mould before that mould or something like that? If they've got a really good explanation as to why, then they're probably judging properly and it's just coincidence and the other person is just seeing something that's not there. If they can't really explain why or they come up with reasons that are like wrong, that's when you need to address it. So it may be that they're doing something like placing moulds not together or something like that, um, despite the fact that they're all in good condition. They might turn around and go, well, I placed one of that mould, so I wanted to place one of the other mould. So you could sort of th then be within the rights and remind them and say, well, actually, our shows, that's not how I'd like it to be judged. This is my show. I'd like it to be judged in this way. It could be you could say something like, oh, OK, I'm going to get so-and-so who would like to co-judge with you. Um, because they would like to just judge a few more classes or I'm going to co-judge with you because I just really want to judge this class. Um, so you can do stuff like that. It doesn't have to be accusatory. It can be like quite friendly and a little bit sort of just informal and that can give you a little bit of support. You really don't want to be in a situation where you're going, no, you're not going to be judging any more classes because your judging is crap. That's really rude and it's not very nice. 
But if you can get them judging with someone else who's more experienced, maybe, then that will help them and help them learn and get a little bit more experience, but do it in a more informal fashion. The other thing you're going to find is that there might be something after the show. Now, it may be that something happened at the show that you literally weren't aware of. It may be that that something was a personal issue between two people and they've just had a fight or an argument or some of the stuff that we know has gone on at shows. As a show host, obviously, it's really awkward when that stuff comes up on Facebook. But when it comes to like a personal conflict between two people, it's really not your business. Just stay out of it. Let them argue on Facebook and just accept that the rest of your show went really, really well. And these two people are just being annoying. You may also see criticism of judging afterwards. Now, this is less common, but it does happen. Um, sometimes the best thing to do is to like make a really simple statement, like my rules say that this needs to have been addressed on the day. Um, you should have raised it with the judge at the time. Um, I didn't see any inconsistencies as a show host, but if you've got any problems, could you message me privately to discuss them? Um, I would also, contact the person who runs that Facebook group that you've seen the post in if it's in a Facebook group and just be like remove this because actually any post like that as far as I'm concerned should really be removed um, because it needs to be dealt with with the show host on the day. We've all seen awful judging at shows but we don't go and do public rants and attack people for it. I haven't attacked anyone for some of the stuff that I've seen which has been blatantly wrong I'm not going to go and attack people online afterwards. And that's where it becomes problematic. A lot of the accusations of people placing friends' horses are completely wrong. Um, and we know that because uh, someone accused someone of doing that and I'm their best friend and they didn't place my horse. So either they don't like me or the accusation was completely false. Um, so that can be really, really hard. So just make sure in your rules you've got a little thing about sportsmanship. And as an entrant, if you've got problems with judging on the day, ask the judge. Just ask them why they didn't place your horse. It's not hard to do. And I know sometimes it's scary, but it's far more terrifying as a judge when someone comes up and asks you when they don't place their horse because you're like, oh God, what have I done? I've done something wrong. Oh no, please don't hurt me. Um, it may be that you've spotted something on that horse that they didn't see. And I know we've talked about this before, but actually being nice and being kind and giving people the benefit of the doubt works so much better like hatred breeds hatred you just need to be nice to each other and if you're just nice to each other things are a lot better and i know i'm a nasty person sometimes and i do a lot of bitching and i'm really sorry but actually if you're just nice things work a lot lot better and there isn't much you can do about the hobby trolls they exist you know i deal with them on a regular basis um, other people deal with them. Remember the guy who like attacked every single picture I put of a dinosaur on Instagram for a year? Like <laughs> they exist, you just deal with it. And I know it's really, really hard. So that brings me to the end of the seminar. If you've got any questions, put them in the comment thing and I'm gonna go back through and see if there were any questions or if it was just discussions of Domino's Pizza. I really want Domino's Pizza now. So annoying, I haven't had my dinner. Um, if you do have any questions, legitimate questions, um, post them in the comments and I'm going to go through and read your questions. Um, okay, so there's a lot of just attacking Emma because uh, she's mean. That's fine. You can attack Emma because she's mean. Um, <laughs> Curtis has a load of pent up judging based rage. We all do, Curtis. It's fine, it's fine. Just rant to other people in private. Don't rant publicly on Facebook. Um, we've all got it and we've all seen stuff that's just wrong, but it's fine. At the end of the day, it would be boring if the same horse is placed every single time. Just get over it. Holly says it makes her nervous judging friends models. Yeah, I agree, Holly. It can be really, really tough sometimes um, and really awkward, particularly if you're judging a Supreme and you wanna judge, you wanna place like your best friends model and the other two people are like, yeah, we love it too. And then you're like, oh no, someone is going to think that like this is because we're friends, um, but it's not, it's actually the best model. Just make sure you've got your reasons. Um, so if anyone did approach you, you can just say, well, actually these are my reasons why. Um, Curtis, I'm sorry, I was, it wasn't going to be like a personal attack on people. It was actually just be nice to people. Okay, we're not doing mean things. 
There was no virtual hair pulling. There will be virtual hair pulling if you don't run your show in an efficient fashion and if you sit down and those classes are not being moved, that's when I will pull my hair and I'll come and smack you. That's my threat for the day. Also, I'll smack you if you don't get your judging list on time. Yeah, Curtis, I just hate you. The end of this seminar is now just going to be me hating on Curtis and his orange trousers. There you go. I said it. I went there. Um, if anyone has any legitimate questions, please put them in the sec question thing. Otherwise, I think we can probably uh, bring this to a close. It's been our longest seminar so far. It's gone on forever. Um, I hope you really, really enjoyed it. So some final housekeeping things. Please head to our website. Uh, you can find loads of free downloads to help you run your live show. Um, you can also vote for the next seminar. I can't remember what next week is. Hmm, I don't know. Anyway, we are gonna have another judging seminar. Um, so that'll be really good uh, if you're looking for judging advice. A reminder about BMEX Fun Week. It's coming, it's coming. We're gonna have a social on one of the nights. The schedule is on um, our blog, so make sure you look it up. We're gonna have um, a pub quiz, which is gonna be great fun. Um, we are gonna have a market night sale on the website. We're gonna have an auction on the website. We're gonna have a introduction to the hobby seminar where I talk through all the basic stuff. Great if you're new to the hobby and don't know anything about it. So many awesome things. Marion, I did mention cake. I said you could bake your own cakes and bring them. So I did mention cake. I did not forget cake. Um, yes, um, and also a reminder that pre-orders end on the 30th of June. So if you haven't pre-ordered your mid-year releases, please get them in, get those little forms filled out. You'll find them on our website um, or you can email me um, and post them along. And I hope you enjoyed this seminar. Um, and it gave you an insight a little bit into how I run shows. Honestly, I cannot recommend, I know I'm like sort of blowing my own trumpet, I recommend that section of my website enough. Go and look at it and use the...